Actually, mitral regurgitation is one of my favorite topics. Why? Well, when I was early in my years in echocardiography, it was always me who had to run down to the OR to perform TE studies in patients who underwent mitral valve repair. Now, nobody really liked doing this because you'd stand there the whole time while the surgeons were doing the cool tricks. But it gave me time to look at the mitral valve and to study the mechanism and also the severity of MR. So in reality, I think I benefited very much from going down to the OR. My suggestion, if you have a setting where this is possible, use the opportunity. I think it gives you a much better understanding of many problems we'll discuss in this chapter. In this chapter, we'll talk about the basics of mitral regurgitation, about the hemodynamics, about the consequences for the left ventricle, and also we'll touch the issue of which forms of mitral regurgitation there are. This will serve as a basis for the further chapters. MR is a frequent finding. You will find physiologic or trace MR in very many patients and the incidence probably increases with age. This is such an example where you see just a very small jet here in proximity to the mitral valve. So the detection rate also depends on your machine and also your abilities to display such small jets. Such small degrees of mitral regurgitation don't have any impact on survival on prognosis. However, if you have moderate or severe mitral regurgitation, then the picture looks differently. The natural history of MR is shown in this diagram in the publication which was published many years ago, which does show you that we have an excessive mortality in the presence of significant mitral regurgitation. In a more recent publication by Serrano 2005, he was able to show that the five-year rates for asymptomatic MR are 22 for all-cause mortality, 14 for cardiac mortality, and 33% for cardiac events. So MR is not a benign disease. To understand why MR is detrimental, we have to look at the hemodynamics of MR. Here's a diagram which shows you the hemodynamics in different forms, the acute, chronic, and decompensated MR in comparison to normal. What we see in the normal situation, we have forward flow out through the aortic valve, normal ejection fraction, and normal size of the left ventricle. If acute MR develops, we have flow back into the left atrium. Therefore, to sustain the normal outflow through the left ventricle, through the aorta, we have to compensate by increasing the ejection fraction. We cannot compensate in the early phases by increasing the volume because it's just too early. So we have hypercontractility and a more or less normal size of the left ventricle in the situation of acute MR. In chronic MR, the left ventricle had time to adapt. It adapts by increasing its size. By increasing the size, it is able to eject more blood for each beat. In addition, we also have hypercontractility but not as much as we do in the setting of acute MR. So in the chronic stages, we have the typical picture of volume overload in the setting of MR. Since chronic left ventricular volume overload in the setting of MR is detrimental to the left ventricle, we can eventually see deterioration of left ventricular function. This is what we call decompensated MR. In this situation, we still have significant MR, but we have a problem that the left ventricle is not able to eject enough blood and thereby we have the combination of a large left ventricle with a reduction in left ventricular function. In this situation the patient does not have any symptoms, here he has significant symptoms, here he has no or only mild symptoms and here he's starting to really become symptoms again. Heart rate is normal here, here we have tachycardia, here we have normal to mildly elevated heart rate, and here we have significantly elevated heart rate. To help you understand the interplay between the different forms of MR and what it means to the patient, here are two fictitious but possible clinical courses. Let's say we have a patient who has no or only mild MR, he has no symptoms, he has a very good exercise capacity, and then all of a sudden he has chordal rupture. 
This chordal rupture leads to significant MR, to acute decompensation, and the patient has symptoms. Now, these symptoms obviously become apparent, but the patient might misinterpret them, which is not infrequently found. And then we have a phase of compensation, so the exercise capacity starts to rise again, the patient has almost no symptoms, and he is stable. However, left ventricular function slowly starts to deteriorate, and so we do have a gradual decrease in the exercise capacity until finally we have a phase where the patient actually decompensates. So this is the phase of chronic decompensation in MR. Until this phase, the patient should actually be operated. Here's another example. In this case, we have a patient who has significant MR, which gradually developed, so he does not have any phase of decompensation at the beginning, and he's compensated for a very long time. Now, this can actually last for many, many years, even 10 years or longer. And then, all of a sudden, the left ventricle starts to deteriorate very slowly, very slowly. The patient often does not really even notice he's not as good with his exercise capacity anymore, but then all of a sudden, we have the phase of decompensation, very similar to the example we had we saw previously. One issue I want to bring up here, and which we will be discussing later when we talk about surgery or the indications for surgery, is the problem that exactly in this phase it's so very difficult to really determine when left ventricular function is starting to deteriorate. But now back to the hemodynamics of MR and the consequences. We have left ventricular volume overload, we see elevated left atrial filling pressures and left atrial pressures. The patients develop pulmonary hypertension and tricuspid regurgitation. So the combination of MR and TR is very frequent. A key issue in the interpretation of left ventricular function in the setting of MR is the fact that we have a reduction in afterload in such patients. To help you understand this principle better, imagine you're on the beach and you're trying to pump up one of these rafts for your kids with such a pump. Imagine you have a hole in the pump. Now the hole represents mitral regurgitation. When you apply pressure to the pump, you will have much less resistance as if you do not have such a hole. So this resembles the reduction in afterload we see in patients with mitral regurgitation. It's easy for the ventricle to contract. The ventricle is unloaded. We have a reduction in systolic wall stress and therefore left ventricular function appears better than it is. Now I would like to turn to the causes of mitral regurgitation. We can basically classify MR as either primary or secondary. Primary means we have an abnormality of the mitral valve itself and secondary means we have some form of geometry change of the left ventricle which leads to an incompetent mitral valve. So in the first case we have a structurally abnormal mitral valve in the second case, the mitral valve has a normal morphology. Here's a list of primary or structural causes of MR. Mitral valve prolapse, degenerative disease, rheumatic heart disease, endocarditis, drugs, and congenital. You'll hear more about them in further chapters. For completion, here is a list of the secondary or functional causes of MR annual dilatation, restrictive leaflets, and systolic anterior motion as we see it in the setting of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I think again in this chapter you were able to see how cool echocardiography actually is. With help of echo we can really explain the hemodynamics and the problem a patient has and not only to make the diagnosis. But now we have to make the diagnosis and we have to make a refined diagnosis. We will now turn to the different causes of regurgitation, the different forms of mitral valve pathologies.